Hello class and welcome to This Week in Health Psychology. This week we will be exploring how research is done in health psychology as well as the wide range of topics relating to health psychology. It isn't just research into behaviors, it can also be research into the deepest of beliefs and perceptions that people have relating to other issues, something like a person's personality or a person's spirituality and how it may impact their risk of suicide. So let me tell you a little story about this. There was really growing consensus that both head and heart knowledge of God, so for example, God concepts or doctrinal beliefs about God's love versus God images or experiential knowledge of God's love influences theistic believers' recovery from mental health and substance use disorders. So theorist, sorry, theistic believers derive peace and comfort from their beliefs and experiences of a personal deity who is compassionate and experience them as near and forgiving. Indeed, the 12 step programs and other spiritually oriented models of substance abuse recovery often emphasize the importance of experiencing divine love on a daily basis as a source of strength, of acceptance and wisdom. However, persons in early recovery of substance use disorders may also struggle with their relationship with God in ways that increase their risk for relapse, mental health difficulties, or even suicide. So divine struggle, which is defined by researchers as the negative emotions focused on one's belief about their relationship with God, has been associated with suicidality in other high-risk groups, such as military veterans. However, its role in risk for suicide among persons recovering from substance use disorders was originally unclear. Now, given the increasing pluralism of religious beliefs in the United States where this research took place, divine struggle may affect emotional and spiritual health differently depending upon one's God concepts and head knowledge about God. For example, when someone is in recovery views if they view God as caring and loving, conflicting thoughts or feelings might invalidate these sacred beliefs that provide a foundation for faith. In contrast, when God is viewed as distant and cruel and experiences of this divine struggle occur within the individual, that might not violate one's spiritual meaning system in such a distressing way. Now, there was the research done on this topic by Dr. Joseph Courier, where he investigated all of these possibilities with 144 men who were in their first six months of recovery after serious problems with alcohol. That was 75% of the participants or other substances. Cocaine was over half and opiates was about a third. 15% to 30% of the sample reported having a plan to die by suicide or attempting suicide in their lifetime, thinking about suicide more than once in the past six months and or telling someone they were going to attempt suicide with a desire to die. After accounting for recent suicidal ideation and mental health symptoms such as depression, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, etc. Interactive links emerge between divine struggle and God concepts. Participants who viewed God in cruel or distant terms reported worse suicide risk in general. But divine struggle contributed more notably to perceived likelihood for attempting suicide to the extent to which their experiences were different from their conceptions of God's traits or attributes. So what that means is overall the major findings highlight the potential interplay between God concepts and divine struggle among persons in early recovery with substance use disorders, specifically when compared to cases in which God is viewed in a critical and harsh manner, divine struggle might engender a greater sense of existential dislocation that could lead to a suicide attempt among theistic believers who believe that God is loving and attentive to human beings' concerns. And essentially what the researchers believe is happening here is there is a distress stemming from the discrepancy between the head and heart knowledge relating to God. Now, from a clinical standpoint, this study underscores the need to assess for head and heart knowledge related to God in theistic populations. And this should be associated with screening for suicide risk, particularly among theistic believers. And this should help in the assessment process for those recovering from substance use disorders. And the researchers therefore believe that it's important to consider spiritually integrated treatment options and to give some thought to the doctrinal beliefs and God concepts of the clients in that process. So some interesting research that even beliefs in spirituality have a place within the healthcare system. Now, let's go on and explore more about health beliefs and the research that's done in those areas, because that is our theme for this week. So, changes in causes of death throughout the 20th century can, in part, be explained in terms of changes in behavior-related illnesses, such as coronary heart disease, cancers, and... HIV. And so we will begin our lecture this week by examining some lay theories of health and then explore theories of health behaviors and the extent to which health behaviors can be predicted by health beliefs, such as the attributions that cause health and behavior choices, perceptions of risk and the stages of change model will also be considered. In particular, we will describe the integration of these different types of health belief in the form of models. So we will look at the health belief model, the protection motivation theory, the theory of reasoned action, the theory of planned behavior, and health action process. We will also explore problems with these models and describe studies that address the gap between behavioral intentions and actual behavior. We will then explore how these theories can be used for developing interventions designed to change behavior and finally describe research examining the longer term maintenance of behavioral change. So what is health behavior? 
Well, researchers define three types of health-related behaviors. They suggest that a health behavior was a behavior aimed at preventing disease, such as eating a healthy diet. An illness behavior was a behavior aimed to seek remedy, such as going to the doctor. And a sick role behavior was an activity aimed to get well, such as taking prescribed medication or rest. Health behaviors were also defined by researchers in terms of health impairing habits, which are often called behavioral pathogens, such as smoking, eating a high fat diet, or health protective behaviors, which are defined as behavioral immunogens, such as attending a health check. In short, researchers typically distinguish between those behaviors that have a negative effect, so the behavioral pathogens such as smoking, eating foods high in fat, uh, drinking large amounts of alcohol, and those behaviors that may have a positive effect, the behavioral immunogens, such as brushing your teeth, wearing seat belts, seeking health information, having regular checkups, sleeping an adequate number of hours every night. And generally, health behaviors are regarded as behaviors that are related to the health status of the individual. So, why study health behaviors? Well, over the past century, health behaviors have played an increasingly important role in health and illness. And this relationship has been highlighted by McEwen, and McEwen's thesis has become fairly famous. Uh, the, the decline of infectious diseases in his book, The Role of Medicine, Thomas McEwen examines the impact of medicine on health since the 17th century. In particular, he evaluated the widely held assumptions about medicine's achievements and the role of medicine in reducing the prevalence and incidence of infectious disease illnesses such as tuberculosis, pneumonia, measles, influenza, diphtheria, smallpox, and whooping cough. And Thomas McEwen argued that the commonly held view was that the decline in illness such as tuberculosis, measles, smallpox, and whooping cough was related to medical interventions such as chemotherapy and vaccinations. For example, that antibiotics was responsible for the decline of illness such as pneumonia and influenza. He showed, however, that the reduction in such illnesses was already underway before the development of the relevant medical interventions. McEwen therefore claimed that the decline in infectious diseases seen throughout the past three centuries is best understood not in terms of medical interventions, but in terms of social and environmental factors. He argued that the influence which led to the predominance of infectious diseases from the time of the first agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago were first off insufficient food, secondly environmental hazards, and thirdly excessive numbers and measures which led to their decline from the time of the modern agricultural and industrial revolutions were predictably improved nutrition, better hygiene, and contraception. So, 
the role of behavior becomes extremely important in McEwen's view. And McEwen also examined health and illness throughout the 20th century. And he argued that contemporary illness is caused by influences, which the individual determines by his behavior. Things like smoking, eating, exercise, and the like. And he claimed that it is on modification of personal habits, such as smoking and sedentary living, that health primarily depends. Now, to support this thesis, McEwen examined the main causes of death in affluent societies and observed that most dominant illnesses, such as lung cancer, coronary heart disease, and cirrhosis of the liver, are caused by behaviors. Behavior and mortality, therefore, is that 50% of mortality from the 10 leading causes of death is due to behavior. And this indicates that behavior and lifestyle have a potentially major effect on longevity. So for example, Dahl and Pito in 1981 reported estimates of the role of different factors as causes for all cancer deaths. And they estimated that tobacco consumption accounts for 30% of all cancer deaths, alcohol for 3%, diet for 35%, and reproductive and sexual behavior for 7%. Accordingly, approximately 75% of all deaths due to cancer are related to behavior. More specifically, lung cancer, which is the most common form of cancer, accounts for 36% of all cancer deaths in men and 15% in women in the UK. And it's been calculated that 90% of all lung cancer mortality is attributed to cigarette smoking which is also linked to other illnesses such as cancers of the bladder, the pancreas, the mouth, the larynx, the esophagus, and coronary heart disease. Similarly, in 2004, other researchers concluded that health behaviors such as smoking, poor diet, and sedentary lifestyle can cause serious health problems and are associated with a range of cancers, of diabetes, of health disease, and mortality. So the impact of smoking on mortality was also shown by Thomas McEwen when he examined changes in life expectancies in males from 1838 to 1970, which indicates that the increase in life expectancy shown in non-smokers is much reduced in smokers. The relationship between mortality and behavior is also illustrated by bowel cancer, which accounts for 11% of all cancer deaths in men and 14% in women. Research suggests that bowel cancer is linked to behavior such as a diet high in total fat, high in meat, and low in fiber. So there's also been longevity studies and cross-cultural differences to explore how behavior changes. In Georgia, among the Abkhazians, 400 of every 100,000 live to be over 100, and the oldest recorded Abkhazian is 170, although this is obviously problematic in terms of the validity of any written records in the early 1800s. Other researchers have examined the longevity of the Abkhazians and suggested that their longevity 
relative to that of other countries was due to a combination of biological lifestyle and social factors including things like genetics, maintaining vigorous work roles and habits, a diet low in saturated fat and meat and high in fruit and vegetables, no alcohol or nicotine, high levels of social support, low reported stress levels. An analysis of this group of people suggests that health behaviors may be related to longevity and are therefore very worthy of study. However, we have to admit that cross-sectional studies are problematic to interpret, particularly in terms of the direction of causality. Does the style of the Abkhazians cause their longevity or is it a product of it? There are other longevity studies, for example, by Belloc and Breslau and Breslau and Enstrom. And these researchers examine the relationship between mortality rates and behaviors among 7,000 people. And they concluded from this correlational analysis that seven behaviors were related to health status. And these behaviors were, first off, sleeping seven to eight hours a day. Secondly, having breakfast every day. Thirdly, not smoking. Fourthly, rarely eating between meals. Fifth, being near or at their prescribed weight. Sixth, having moderate or no use of alcohol. And seventh, taking regular exercise. And the sample was followed up by uh, other researchers, five and a half and ten years in prospective studies and the authors reported that these seven behaviors were related to mortality. In addition, they suggested that for people aged over 75 who carried out all of these health behaviors, health was comparable to those aged 35 to 44 who followed less than three. So health behaviors seem to be important in predicting mortality and the longevity of individuals. Health psychologists have therefore attempted to understand and predict health-related behaviors. Some of these research topics have used qualitative methods to explore and understand lay theories and the ways in which people make sense of their health. Other researchers has used quantitative methods in order to describe and predict health behaviors. Lay theories about health, such as research examining lay theories about health and a trend towards using qualitative methods rather than quantitative ones, has revealed some interesting facts. In particular, medical sociologists and social anthropologists have examined beliefs about health in terms of lay theories or lay representations. And using in-depth interviews to encourage subjects to talk freely, studies have explored the complex and elaborate beliefs that individuals have. And research in this area has shown that these lay theories are at least as elaborate and sophisticated as medicine's own explanatory models, even though they may be different. So, for example, medicine describes upper respiratory tract infections such as the cold, common cold as self-limiting illnesses caused by viruses. However, Hellman, in his paper, Feed a Cold, Starve a Flu, explored how individuals make sense of the common cold and other associated problems and reported that such illnesses 
were analyzed in terms of the dimensions of hot and cold, wet and dry with respect to their etiology and possible treatment. In one study, other researchers reported that working class mothers were more likely to see illness as uncontrollable and to take a more fatalistic view of their health. And in another study, researchers reported that although women who smoke are aware of all the health risks of smoking, they report that smoking is necessary to their well-being and an essential means to, for coping and stress. Lay theories of obvious implications for interventions by health professionals. Communication between health professionals and patients would be impossible, for example, if the patients held beliefs about their health that were in conflict with those held by the professional. So it's important to be mindful of health beliefs. So how can we look now at predicting health behaviors? Now there's been a, a lot of research using quantitative methods to explore and predict health behaviors. So for example, Christensen in the 1980s carried out a correlational study looking at the seven health behaviors defined by previous researchers and their relationship to a set of beliefs. And she reported that these seven health behaviors were correlated with, first off, a high value on health, secondly, a belief in world peace, and thirdly, a low value on an exciting life. So, obviously, these are problems, sorry, there's problems with defining these different beliefs, but the study suggests that it is perhaps possible to predict health behaviors based upon beliefs. And other researchers have described factors that they believe predicted health behaviors. Social factors such as learning reinforcement, modeling and social norms. Genetics suggesting that perhaps there was some evidence for a genetic basis for alcohol use, for example. Emotional factors such as anxiety, stress, tension, and fear. Perceived symptoms such as pain, breathlessness, and fatigue. The belief of the patient and the beliefs of the health professionals all can work and be combined to predict health behaviors. Researchers also suggested that a combination of these factors could be used to predict and promote health-related behaviors. In fact, most of the research that has aimed to predict health behaviors has actually emphasized looking at beliefs. And approaches to health beliefs include attribution theory, the health locus of control, the unrealistic optimism view, the self-affirmation theory, and the stages of change model. So we'll take a look at all of those in the remaining time we have left. So let's look at the development of attribution theory. The origins of attribution theory can be found in the work of Heider in the 1940s and 1950s, who argued that individuals are motivated to see their social world as predictable and controlled and controllable. That is, a need to understand causality. And researchers have developed these original ideas and proposed a clearly defined attribution theory suggesting that attributions about causality were structured according to causal schemata made up of the following criteria. Distinctiveness, so the attribution about the cause of a behavior is specific to the individual carrying out the behavior. 
consensus. The attribution about the cause of a behavior would be shared by others. And consistency over time, the same attribution about causality would be made at any other time. And consistency over modality, the same attribution would be made in different situations. And now, other researchers have argued that attributions are made according to these different criteria and that the type of attribution made, so for example, high distinctiveness, low consensus, low consistency over time, low consistency over modality, determines the extent to which the cause of a behavior is regarded as a product of a characteristic internal to the individual or external. So for example, the environment or situation. Since its original formulation, attribution theory has been developed extensively and differentiations have been made between self-attributions, so attributions about one's own behavior and other attributions, attributions made about the behavior of others. In addition, the dimensions of attribution have been redefined as follows. Internal versus external. So my failure to get a job is due to my poor performance in the interview versus the interviewer's prejudice. Stable versus unstable. The cause of my failure to get a job will always be around versus was specific to that one event global versus specific. For example, the cause of my failure to get the job influences other areas of my life versus on, it only influences this specific job interview. And controllable versus uncontrollable. So for example, the cause of my failure to get a job was controllable by me versus was uncontrollable by me. Now, Brickman and other researchers have also distinguished between attributions made about the causes of a problem and attributions made about the possible solution. For example, they claim that whereas an alcoholic may believe that he is responsible for becoming an alcoholic due to his lack of willpower, an attribution about the cause, he may believe that the medical profession is responsible for making him well again, an attribution for the solution. So attributions for health-related behavior um, is another topic that we should take a look at here. And attribution theory has been applied to the study of health and health-related behavior. So researchers back in the 1970s interviewed 80 people about the general causes of health and illness and found that health is regarded as internal to the individual and illness is seen as something that comes into the body from the external world. More specifically, attributions about illness may, may be related to behaviors. So for example, Bradley in the 1980s examined patients attributions for responsibility for their diabetes and reported that perceived control over the illness that is the diabetes is controllable by me or a powerful other influenced the choice of treatment by the patients so patients could choose first off an insulin pump so a small mechanical device attached to the skin which provides a continuous flow of insulin or two intense conventional treatment or three a continu uh, continuation of daily injections and the results indicated that the patients who chose an insulin pump showed decreased control over their diabetes and increased control attributed to powerful doctors Therefore, 
If an individual attributed their illness externally and felt that they were personally were not responsible for it, they were more likely to choose the insulin pump and were more likely to hand over responsibility to the doctor. Now, a further study by King again in the 1980s, examined the relationship between the attributions for an illness and attendance at a screening clinic for hypertension. And the results demonstrated that if the hypertension was seen as external but controllable by the individual, then they were more likely to attend the screening clinic. So, for example, I am not responsible for my hypertension, but I can control it would be the dominant internal dialogue within those individuals. Let's also take a look at health locus of control. The internal versus external dimension of attribution theory has been specifically applied to health in terms of the concept of a health locus of control. Individuals differ as to whether they tend to regard events as controllable by them, so an internal locus of control, or uncontrollable by them, an external locus of control. And Walston and Walston have developed a measure of the health locus of control, which evaluates whether an individual regards their health as controllable by them. So, for example, I am directly responsible for my health. Whether they believe their health is not controllable by them and in the hands of fate. So, for example, whether I am well or not is a matter of luck. Or, whether they regard their health as under the control of powerful others. So, for example, I can only do what my doctor tells me to do. Health locus of control has been shown to be related to whether an individual changes their behavior. So, for example, giving up smoking. And to the kind of communication style they require from health professionals. For example, if a doctor encourages an individual who is generally external to change their lifestyle, the individual is unlikely to comply if they do not deem themselves responsible for their health. Now, although the concept of health locus of control is intuitively interesting, there are some problems with it. Things like, is the health locus of control a state or trait? So, am I always internal, for example? Is it possible to be both external and internal in your locus of control? Or is going to the doctor for help external? So, the power of the doctor is what will make you well. Or internal, I am determining my health status by searching out appropriate interventions. So there is some control and clarity that could still be taken in that kind of research. Next, let's take a look at unrealistic optimism. So Weinstein, a researcher back in the 1980s, suggested that one of the reasons that people continue to practice unhealthy behaviors is due to inaccurate perceptions of risk and susceptibility. In other words, their unrealistic optimism. Now he asked subjects to examine a list of health problems and to state compared to other people of their age and sex, what are your chances of getting the problem? Were they greater than, about the same as, or less than theirs? And the result of the study showed that most subjects believe that they were less likely to get the health problem. 
And Weinstein called this phenomenon unrealistic optimism, as he argued that not everyone can be less likely to control an illness, or sorry, to contract an illness. So Weinstein described four cognitive factors that contribute to unrealistic optimism. First, lack of personal experience with the problem. Second, the belief that the problem is preventable by individual action. Third, the belief that if the problem has not yet appeared, it will not appear in the future. And fourth, the belief that the problem is infrequent. And these factors suggest that perception of their own risk is not a nat rational process. It's an attempt to explain why individual assessments of their risk may go wrong and why people are unrealistic, unrealistically optimistic. And so Weinstein argued that individuals show selective focus. He claimed that individuals essentially deceive themselves to make themselves feel better. They ignore their own risk increasing behavior. So, for example, an internal monologue of someone might be, I may not always practice safe sex, but that's not important. And focus primarily on their risk-reducing behavior, but at least I don't inject drugs. He also argues that this selectivity is compounded by egocentrism. So individuals tend to ignore others' risk-decreasing behavior, so my friends all practice safe sex, but that's irrelevant. Therefore, an individual may be unrealistically optimistic if they focus on the times they use condoms when assessing their own risk and ignore the times they do not. And in addition, focus on the times that others around them do not practice safe sex and ignore the times that they do. In one study, subjects were required to focus on either their sex their risk increasing for unsafe sex or their risk decreasing behavior, safe sex. And the effect of this on their unrealistic optimism for risk of HIV was examined. And so for heterosexual subjects who were asked to complete a questionnaire concerning their beliefs about HIV, and their sexual behavior, subjects were allocated to either the risk increasing or de risk decreasing condition. Subjects in the risk increasing condition were asked to complete questions such as, since being sexually active, how often have you asked your partner's HIV status? And it was assumed that only a few subjects would be able to answer that they have done this frequently, thus making their, them feel more at risk. Subjects in the risk decreasing condition were asked questions such as, since being sexually active, how often have you tried to select your partners carefully? It was believed that most subjects would answer that they did this, making them feel less at risk. And the results showed that focusing on risk decreasing factors increased optimism by increasing perceptions of others' risk. Therefore, by encouraging the subjects to focus on their own healthy behavior, so for example, I select my partners carefully, they felt more unrealistically optimistic and rated themselves as less at risk compared to those who they perceived as being more at risk. Then there is self-affirmation theory. So central to unrealistic optimism is the notion of risk perception and the proposal that individuals can process risk information in ways that enable them to continue their unhealthy behavior. In fact, research suggests that those least persuaded by risk data are often those most at risk. 
An example of this is smokers ability to continue to smoke even when the words smoking kills are written on their packet of cigarettes. Recently, however, it has been suggested that self-affirmation may help reduce the tendency to resist threat information. Self-affirmation theory suggests that people are motivated to protect their sense of self-integrity and their sense of themselves as being adaptively and morally adequate. Therefore, it present, if presented with information that threatens their sense of self, they behave defensively. However, if given the opportunity to self-affirm in another domain of their lives, then their need to become defensive is reduced. For example, if a smoker thinks that they are a sensible person when confronted with a message that says that smoking is not sensible, their integrity is threatened and they behave defensively by blocking the information. If given the chance, however, to think about other area, another area in which they are sensible then they are less likely to become defensive about the anti-smoking message. A couple of recent studies have tested the impact of self-affirmation on the processing of information about the link between alcohol and breast cancer in young women and smoking in young smokers. In the first study, young women who were drinking above the recommended limit were randomized either to the self-affirmation condition or the control condition. And those in the self-affirmation condition were asked to write about their most important value and why it was important to them. And all were then given a health message about the links between excessive alcohol intake and breast cancer. The results showed that those who had self-affirmed were more accepting of the health message. In a similar study, smokers were asked to study four images depicting the dangers of smoking and half underwent a self-affirmation task. And these results also showed that those who had self-affirmed rated the images as more threatening and reported higher levels of self-efficacy and intentions to stop smoking. Therefore, it would seem that although people can deny and block the risks associated with their behavior, this defensive approach is reduced if they are encouraged to self-affirm. And this approach then has implications for a wide range of health-related behaviors and the development of more effective interventions to change behavior. Then there is the stages of change model. And the trans-theoretical model of behavior change was originally developed by researchers in the 1980s as a synthesis of 18 different therapies describing the process involved in eliciting and maintaining change. And it's now more commonly known as the stages of change model. And researchers examined these different therapeutic approaches for common processes and suggest that a new model of behavior change based upon the following model, following stages. First, pre-contemplation. The not intending to make any changes, but their given information. Then contemplation, they're considering a change. Then the preparation, they're making small changes. Then the action, they're actively engaging in the behavior and then maintenance, sustaining the change over time. And these stages, however, do not always occur in a linear fashion. You don't simply move from one to five. But the theory describes behavior change as a dynamic and not all or nothing. For example, an individual may move to the preparation stage and then back to the contemplation stage several times before progressing to the action stage. Furthermore, 
even when an individual has reached the maintenance stage, they may slip back to the contemplation stage over time. Now, the model also examines how the individual weighs up the cost and benefits of a particular behavior. In particular, researchers argue that individuals at different stages of change will differentially focus on either the cost of behavior. So, for example, stopping smoking will make me more anxious or the benefits of the behavior. Stopping smoking will improve my health. So, for example, a smoker at the action I have stopped smoking and the maintenance stages tend to focus on the favorable and positive features of their behavior. I feel healthier because I have stopped smoking, for example. Whereas smokers in the contemplation stage tend to focus on the negative features of the behavior. It will make me anxious. The stages of change model has been applied to several health-related behaviors such as smoking, alcohol use, exercise, and screening behavior. And if applied to smoking sensation, the model would suggest that the following sets of beliefs and behaviors at the different stages. So for example, the pre-contemplation stage has internal dialogue like, I am happy being a smoker and intend to continue smoking. The second stage, the contemplation stage, the internal dialogue would be more like, I've been coughing a lot recently, perhaps I should think about stopping smoking. Then the third stage, the preparation stage, the internal dialogue may be something like, I will not, or I will stop going to the pub and I will buy lower tar cigarettes. And then the fourth stage, the action stage, the internal dialogue may be something like, I've stopped smoking. And the fifth stage, the maintenance stage, the internal dialogue may be something like, I have stopped smoking for four months now. And this individual, however, may well move back at times to believing that they will continue to smoke and may relapse, called the revolving door schema. So the stages of change model in, is increasingly used in research and as a basis to develop interventions that are tailored to the particular stage of the specific person concerned. So for example, a smoker who has been identified as being at the preparation stage would receive a different intervention to one who was at the contemplation stage. However, the model has recently been criticized for the following reasons. First off, it is difficult to determine whether behavior changes occur according to stages or along a continuum. And researchers describe the difference between linear patterns between stages, which are not consistent with a stage model, and continuity patterns, which are consistent. However, the absence of qualitative differences between stages could either be due to the absence of stages or because the stages have not been correctly assessed and identified. Uh, changes between stages may happen so quickly as to make the stages unimportant. Otherwise, interventions that have been based on the stages of change model may work because the individual believes that they are receiving special attention rather than because of the effectiveness of the model per se. And most studies based on the stages of change model use cross-sectional designs to examine differences between different people at different stages of change. So, Overall, such designs do not allow conclusions that are clear to be drawn about the role of different causal factors at the different stages. So, for example, 
people at the preparation stage are driven forward by different factors than those at the contemplation stage. Uh, experiential and experimental and longitudinal studies are needed for any conclusions about causality to be made clear. And the whole concept of stage is not a simple one as it includes many variables such as current behavior, uh, the quit attempts, the intention to change, and time since quitting. So there's lots of different issues. And so in summary, attribution theory and the health locus of control emphasize attributions for causality and control. Unrealistic optimism and self-affirmation theory focus on perceptions of susceptibility and risk. And the stages of change model emphasizes the dynamic nature of beliefs time and costs of, and benefits. And these different aspects of health beliefs have been integrated into structured models of health beliefs and behavior. So for simplicity, these models are often all called social cognition models, as they regard cognitions as being shared by individuals within the same society. However, for the purpose of this lecture, these models will be divided into cognition models and social cognition models in order to illustrate that the varying extent to which the models specifically place cognitions within a social context. So let's look at cognition models. Cognition models examine the predictors and precursors to health behaviors, and they are derived from subjective expected utility theory. And this was something that was proposed by Edwards back in the 1950s, which suggested that behaviors result from a rational weighing up of the potential costs and benefits of that behavior. Cognition models describe behavior as a result of rational information processing and emphasize individual cognitions, not the social context of those cognitions. And so this next section that we talk about will examine the health belief model and the protective motivation theory. The health belief model was developed initially by Rosenstock in the 1960s and further by Becker and various colleagues throughout the 1970s and 80s in order to predict behavior. Now, here are some problems with research in this area that you may wish to consider. First off, asking people about their health beliefs may not be a benign process. It may actually change the way they think. Secondly, we study health beliefs as a means to understand and change behavior. It is possible that the beliefs that predict and explain behavior are different to those that change behavior. Uh, thirdly, much research in this field relies upon self-report measures of behavior, and these may not always be accurate. However, objective measures may not always be possible to obtain. And then fourth, much research in this area relies on cross-sectional designs which assess beliefs and behaviors at the same time. So overall conclusions are then that are made about the ways in which beliefs predict behavior. And it, it is possible, however, that behaviors predict or cause beliefs. Even longitudinal designs cannot entirely get around this problem. Only experimental designs can really allow conclusions about causality to be made. Then there is the issue that there are many factors that may influence how a person behaves which cannot be captured by any individual model. There is trying to explain as much variance as possible can make the research too focused and too far removed from the interesting psychological questions. 
Now, overall, the HBM predicts the behavior as a result of a set of core beliefs, which have been redefined over the years. The original core beliefs are the individual's perceptions, their susceptibility of illness, their severity of the illness, the costs involved in carrying out the behavior and the benefits involved in carrying out the behavior and the cues to action which may be internal. And the health behavior model suggests that these core beliefs should be used to predict the likelihood that a behavior will occur. Now in response to criticisms the health behavior model has been revised originally to add the construct health motivation to reflect an individual's readiness to be concerned about health matters. So for example, I am concerned that smoking might damage my health. And more recently, researchers have also suggested that perceived control, so for example, I am confident that I can stop smoking, should be added to the model. And using the health behavior model then, if we apply the health-related behavior such as a screening for cervical cancer, the health behavior model predicts regular screening for cervical cancer if an individual perceives that she is highly susceptible to cancer in the cervix, that cervical cancer is a severe health threat, that the benefits of regular screening are high and that the costs of such an action are comparatively low. And this is also true if she is subjected to cues to action that are external, such as a leaflet from the doctor's waiting room, or internal, such as a symptom perceived to be related to cervical cancer, whether that is correct or not, uh, such as pain or irritation. And when using the new amended health behavior model, the model would also predict that a per woman should attend for screening if she is confident that she can do so and if she is motivated to maintain her health. So health information aims to increase knowledge and several studies report a significant relationship between illness knowledge and preventative health behavior. Researchers report that knowledge about breast cancer, for example, is related to regular mammograms. Several studies have also indicated a positive correlation between knowledge about breast self-examination and breast cancer and performing breast self-examinations. One study manipulated knowledge about PAP tests for cervical cancer by showing subjects an informative videotape and reported that the resulting increased knowledge was related to future healthy behavior. Conflicting findings, however, um, have shown through several studies have reported conflicting findings about this. So researchers have found that high healthy behavioral intentions are related to low perceived severity, not high as predicted. And several studies have suggested an association between low susceptibility, not high, and healthy behavior. So when all of this is a applied to the health behavior model to cervical cancer and used to examine which factors predict cervical screening behavior, the results suggest that barriers to action was the best predictor of behavioral intentions and that the perceived susceptibility to cervical cancer was also significantly related to screening behavior. Now, there are some criticisms of the health behavior model. The health behavior model has been criticized for having some conflicting results. And it's also been criticized for having several other weaknesses, including the following. It's too focused on conscious processing of information. So, for example, is toothbrushing really determined by weighing the pros and cons of it? Its emphasis on the individual 
So for example, what role does the social and economic environment play? The interrelationship between the different core beliefs. So for example, how should these be measured and how should they be related to each other? And is the model linear or multifactorial? There's the absence of a role of, for emotional factors such as fear and denial. So there are a number of issues that are lead to criticism of the health behavior model, just like other models. Uh, no model really is above criticism. Let's go on now and take a look at this uh, protection motivation theory. And although there is much contradiction in the literature surrounding the health behavior model, researchers has used aspects of this model to predict screening for things like hypertension, screening for cervical cancer, genetic screening, exercise behavior, decreased alcohol use, changes in diet and smoking. And so the protection motivation model originating from Rogers in the 1970s and 80s developed the protection behavior motivation theory. And protection motivation theory expands really on the health behavior model and includes additional factors. So the components of the protection motivation theory, uh, the original protection motivation theory claimed that health related behaviors are a product of four components. First off, severity. So for example, something like bowel cancer is a serious illness. And two, susceptibility. So for example, my chances of getting bowel cancer are high. Response effectiveness. So for example, changing my diet would improve my health. And four, self-efficacy. So for example, I am confident that I can change my diet. And these components predict behavioral intentions. So, for example, I intend to change my behavior, which are related to behavior. And Rogers has suggested a fifth rule for a, a component, fear. So, for example, a emotional response in response to education or information. So the pr protection motivation model describes severity, susceptibility, and fear as related to threat appraisal. So for example, appraising an outside threat and response effectiveness and self-efficacy is relating to coping appraisal, appraising the individual themselves. So according to the protection motivation theory, there are two types of sources of information, environmental, so things like verbal persuasion and observational learning and intrapersonal. So for example, prior experience. And this information influences the five components of protection motivation theory. Self-efficacy, response effectiveness, severity, susceptibility, and fear, which then elicit either an adaptive coping response, for example, a behavioral intention, or a maladaptive coping response, avoidance or denial. So using the protection motivation theory, if applied to dietary change, for example, the protection motivation theory would make the following predictions. Information about the role of a high fat diet in coronary heart disease would increase fear, increase the individual's perception of how serious coronary heart disease was, their perceived severity, and increase their belief that they were likely to have a heart attack, perceived susceptibility and susceptibility. If the individual also felt confident that they could change their diet, self-efficacy, and that this change would have beneficial consequences, response effectiveness, they would report high intentions to change their behavior, behavioral intentions. And this would be seen as an adaptive coping response to the information. And there's been some support for the protection motivation theory. Researchers have given women information about breast cancer, for example, and examined the 
effect of this information on the components of the protection motivation theory and the relationship to the woman's intentions to practice breast self-examinations. And the results showed that the best predictors of intentions to practice breast self-examinations was response effectiveness, severity, and self-efficacy. In a further study, the effects of persuasive appeals for increasing exercise on intentions to exercise were evaluated using the components of this protection motivation theory. And the results showed that susceptibility and self-efficacy predicted exercise intentions, but that none of the variables were related to self-reports of actual behavior. In another study, researchers manipulated dental students' beliefs about tooth decay using persuasive communication. And the results showed that the information increased fear and that severity and self-efficacy were related to behavioral intentions. More recently, researchers have also used the protection motivation theory to predict the child's adherence to wearing an eye patch. Parents of children diagnosed with eye problems completed a baseline questionnaire concerning their beliefs and a follow-up questionnaire after two months describing the child's level of adherence. The results showed that perceived susceptibility and response costs were significant predictors of adherence. So, we've taken a look at several models here. We've taken a look at the protection motivation theory. We've taken a look at the health behavior uh, model and sorry the health belief model and we've taken a look as well at several social cognition models stages of change model etc all of these models give different views of how behavior is changed and how we can influence individuals through education to help them to live healthier lives. And I hope you uh, appreciate the complex dynamics of this field and appreciate just how powerful self-deception can sometimes be in allowing individuals to continue with their unhealthy behavior. I hope you enjoyed this week and I'll see you next week. You take care. Bye-bye.